Um, right, so, so the, the purpose of this session was, I think, to, to talk about um, uh, in and amongst all of us. So let me just mute my, my notifications. Right, yeah, so the purpose of this, this particular session, I thought it'd be useful for everyone to, you know, that's, that's been at this hackathon and, and has given us your awesome contributions. Um, but we'll, we'll sort of go over some of this in the wrap up session at five o'clock um, Central European time and see exactly what we've achieved and how we've achieved it. But the purpose of this session really was more to, you know, now that you guys have had a feel for what we're doing on an NF core in terms of um, using modules, some of you are quite experienced now with using them, you know, you've written your own pipelines around the current syntax that we've got. Um, I think there was always at the back of my mind um, and uh, possibly others as well, is that we're not necessarily exploiting NextFlow as natively as we possibly can um, with the current syntax. And so, there were some workarounds that I came up with sort of last year to, to attempt to, to figure some of this stuff out um, and make things work. And it works, but it's, it's not as native as I mentioned. And so to show you what I mean, uh, I've got a prototype pull request. So now you guys have, have already, like I said, contributed your own modules. You know what the syntax looks like. You know how we're passing stuff around. You've hopefully got the tests working and all of that now. So. Um, uh, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, okay, cool. So what we have, uh, so I created this prototype pull request now for a fast GC, well, I'm probably not going to find it with all these new modules that have been added. Oh, here we go. Um, so with the new syntax, essentially what we'll be doing is getting rid of all of these custom. So we had this functions.nf file, which you guys would have seen now. Um, that just contains some basic functions that allowed um, allowed us to publish files in a custom way and and also um, pass optional arguments around for each specific tool. So if a tool needs arguments, you'd initialize this this map and then pass that to the module. What we can do now with with what the new syntax is get rid of all of this, dump all of this, all of this save file stuff. Um, and start using um, more NextFlow native options. And when I mean NextFlow native options, what I mean essentially is you won't be able to see it on this, um, on this particular pull request is that instead of saving files like this with custom options and so on, so this is essentially a custom function with save files that is coming from here. What we can do now is pass all of these options directly from a single config file. So if I show you an implementation, as to what that would look like. Um, a lot of this has actually been done by Mahesh, so kudos to him. Uh, and we had a, quite a, quite a, an in-depth conversation today with a bunch of other people um, trying to figure out how to finesse this off and so we can actually push it into, into mainstream adoption. So what I mean by that is um, we can use process selectors like this where we, um, we can then say that any process with this particular name, for example, instead of having options.args now, we can use the next row task.extension option to pass these arguments directly to the module. So if you see on that prototype pull request now, we aren't using any options.suffix. This is directly, this is a known way of passing options directly to modules using this task.extension. And the name of this can be whatever you want it to be. It can be suffix, it can be supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, it can be whatever you want it to be. Um, and so that offers a lot more flexibility in terms of how we pass these around. I mean, we're not then restricted to also three arguments, like args three or args four. We can do whatever we want. For the most, for most cases, we should just need one set of arguments. For some tools that have piping and other stuff, you can have second sets of arguments and stuff. But I hope you get what I mean. So. This is inbuilt NextFlow type functionality that we can exploit and use um, within modules. Um, another thing is also the publishing option. So now as you can see, we've deleted a bunch of this block of code in terms of how we publish by default. 
So again, what all we're doing really is just using process selectors to suggest how we'd like to publish these files. Um, and there's, there's a number of ways you can customize this. You can add patterns, um, you can um, change the mode, you can even enable um, you can even enable publishing based on custom parameters as well, which is really neat actually. And you know, it, it means you don't need an if statement. You can just say, you know, only publish this if this parameter is set to true. So for example, I only want to publish this index if params.say reference is true. So now hopefully you get an idea that we're we're moving more towards um, using next and next load, you know. Is, is amazing in terms of the functionality that it offers. I'm not just saying that because power is the audience. Um, I'll tell him straight up if it's not right. Um, but it, it, the flexibility that we need to have this sort of implement, implementation is already there. Um, and it's sort of been bought out mostly, like I said, by Mahesh in terms of making this happen. So um, that's kind of where we're going with the new syntax. But what, all, what this also means is that um, I can compromise this because it's got some changes here. Um, what this also means is that we can get rid of a lot of the logic that we would have had. Um, let's see if I can go to here. Oops. Jump to. Let's have a look at the main script, the diff of the main script. So with the old syntax, I was defining all of these parameters here in order to pass them around. So we had this, this thing where we went from the modules.config file and adjusting any parameters in the, in the workflow. And then that was then being passed off. Um, so actually, no, it was going from the modules config um, to sub workflows that are then being loaded in the workflow. And then, you know, it's just, it's just lots of options being passed around. And we had this sort of include syntax where we were changing those options. But now all of this is happening directly via that modules config. So we can literally just do a massive delete. We don't need to use this add params anymore because all of these options are coming directly from that config file. And so you can see this massive red where now all of these options are now just changed in a single config file. So you can kind of understand why I'm really excited about this because it just means that you don't, not only does it for, for beginners, it, you know, it helps them figure out how these options are being passed around because they're in a single place but it also means that it's easier to maintain and update and develop in this way um and it and the, the first port of call obviously was to do this type of thing in in a real world implementation which is why we chose the rnac pipeline because that tends to be sort of you know the cutting edge type implementation for anything dsl2 we've had and so the, the first thing we tried to do was have an end-to-end -end implementation of the RNASIC to try and find and iron out any issues. Um, and it seems like um, pretty much everything is covered. Um, so here it, at the workflow level, we've we basically deleted so much stuff there. And then um, so workflow where we've done something similar. Again, we don't need to pass these options now around everywhere. Um, and initialize them. We can just directly go from the config file to the module itself. Because you keep the config within the, the parameter within the config, basically. How you manage, I didn't get how you managed to replace the up parameter thing. How? Um, yeah. Because we're because we're, we're using task extension to pass um, the So all of the all of the arguments that we were using for um, oh, okay they are already there basically exactly so so the only the only thing and I think we need to talk to you about this Paolo as well in a second is 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 the caching mechanism for this um, but I'll come back to that in a second um, so so yeah we can another thing that was quite important that we needed to maintain was that if in a given workflow you you say you call SAM tools index more than once in a workflow we needed to be able to independently change the options for both of those instances. Um, so in this case, for example, if you use bed tool genome cut curve as a process selector, if you call this module twice in the in the pipeline, then it would overwrite the options for both of these instances. However, 
Um, again, Mahesh found this way whilst we're discussing and trying to iron out these issues um, where you can use some quite clever process selectors to hone in on exactly the, the right version or incarnation of that module you want to change, the options you want to change. And so then that means that, you know, if you want to run, say, fast QC pre-trimming and post-trimming, you can have completely separate options for the one pre-trimming and post-trimming, and even the publishing options and all of that. And so that was quite important because obviously you need to segregate, um, you know, where even, you know, the simplest level where you publish these files. I think this context would be also interesting to mention that what's your timeline to implement this? Well, <laughs> Um, no, so we 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 were thinking before Christmas, and that's not. Well, oh, it's not for sale. It's not for sale. Um, because I think also because we were thinking talking about this stuff, there was a, a lot of discussion not long on in this context. Instead of having this huge, okay, I love this fact that we are moving all these things from the script to the config. This is definitely great idea but still maybe it's not optimal and the optimal would be to uh, a config for each model and then in that config you could put the publish here instead of to have this huge configuration with all the tasks you know what i mean we actually discussed this literally just now um so so another thing that we want to do um i'll, I'll skip on to that now because you brought it up um so what we're thinking of, so NFCO modules at the moment is specifically just for like units. So like FastQC or PWA index or Minimap or Salmon. So it may be single tool type modules, but what we also want to do is extend it to work with sub workflows. And a sub workflow is um, a chain of modules, right? So um, it's, it's more than one module essentially. Um, and so we've put this next, next flow config with it in anticipation that we could have some default options. Um, I mean, this this isn't representative what would be in here, but for example, you can imagine there'll be with name process selectors in this next world config file as well to set some default publishing options and extension of arguments and so on. But I think we identified that the problem with that is that um, The process selectors that we set in this config file will be specific to this sub workflow context, uh, not the workflow context. Uh, okay. Do you see what I mean? So, yeah. if you if you have um, this align bow tie to um, module here, say you set a process selector for um, I don't know bow tie to align. So you do something like. Uh -huh. um, Process with name uh, we have an extension of is equal to my thing. Now the process selector will be based on the name of this particular um, module that's been used in the context of this sub workflow, but when you actually use it in the workflow context, it could be it could be first of all aliased, right? So you wouldn't be using exactly this name in the workflow. Yeah. You can use Bowtie two as Bowtie two aligned once, and then Bowtie two aligned as Bowtie two aligned twice. Like you want to have control for yeah, exactly. Know, instance for this model exactly. Otherwise, okay. we'll, get, we'll get a warning saying that this process selector isn't recognized. Something that you fixed just now with the process selector name warnings. We uh -huh. get that with this if we try and use that uh, the vanilla version. So we had a chat about this earlier, and, and uh, yeah, it would be nice. Um, maybe in the next iteration we can figure out how to do that. But but for, for for simplistic purposes, I think we would have all sub workflow type options in this in a config file like this. But for the purposes of unit testing type stuff. Okay, makes sense to me. Okay, that was just an idea. It could be better, but if not, okay, just yeah. I think it's the I think it's just the different context that you run it in. It might cause too confusion, um, oh, yeah. but it's definitely something we can probably you know revisit in the future. Um, 
Right, so that's that's basically the functionality. I don't think, have I missed anything? Mahesh, Gregor, Jose, anyone else that was in on those chats? Have I missed anything in terms of what we discussed this morning and what this can offer? Okay, cool, right. So that's, that's basically how the new syntax will look. Um, like I briefly alluded to earlier, we're hoping to um, get this RNA seq pull request um, uh, sorted out as soon as possible. Um, and end to end, the tests are passing, which is always nice, but we're hoping to sort this pull request out um, as soon as possible uh, and try and iron out all of these issues and stuff. And then, we will update all modules on NF core modules, which means that things will almost definitely break if you try and update them. So there will be breaking changes at some point, just a heads up. Um, but I think it, things will just be much more simpler with this whole syntax. We're still playing around with a few things and the discussions this morning were really helpful around, you know, just really sitting down and talking about this. Um, and then hopefully, so the process is update and release our uh, NF core modules all in one go. Um, and so we can just do a find and replace because everything is standardized. And, and you know, one of the reasons we insist on it being standardized is that it will make this sort of mass changes quite easy to do. Um, and then, uh, thank you for correcting that spelling. Uh, and then after that, we will release our NASIC because obviously we need to update the modules first to install them in the pipeline. Um, we'll release RNA-seq as a proof of concept and then push those changes to the NF4 tools package um, to get a stable release out. So it's, it's been a bit annoying that you have to use the dev version of tools to, to actually get the latest version. This, and then it's basically because we're not releasing it often enough and we, we're, we're missing a trick there in terms of having more contributors to NF4 tools. So if you like programming Python and you think we can help with that, that would be awesome because you know, all of this functionality with sub workflows and modules and stuff will require some backend tooling as well. Um, and if you're up for that, that would be awesome. Um, so yeah, the idea is update modules, install an RNA seq, and then have a mass release of tools. So I don't think we'll have a release of tools now until we've implemented these changes. I don't think there's any point in having an intermediate release of tools because um, of the fact that we know these changes are coming. And so that's kind of the, the process, um, uh, you know, the mind map, I think we've been thinking about in terms of implementing this. And then obviously in the future, we've just also had a session talking about this sub workflow stuff and how we can have standard sub workflows on NF core modules. And I think this will be really cool because it means that not only are you just installing, you know, individual units or modules within your pipeline, you can install a whole chain of modules and just plug it directly into your pipeline with some sensible defaults. And so you don't need to worry about these individual units. You just got them, you know, a chain of modules that you can just plug in and use directly. And so we've had, again, we've had some more discussions about that today, which have been really useful. Um, but I think that the key there is that what we want to be able to do is, is test these sub workflows in the context of modules. So you can imagine if you update a fast QC module and that fast QC module is used by a sub workflow that runs fast QC and trim the law, for example, we want the CI to work in a way that if you change the module that it runs the sub workflow as well. So you can fix both at the same time. And then that just allows the, the repository to be a bit more self-sustained that way. So you know, people coming to contribute can, can have, you know, fix all of this stuff and, and everything is always working on the repository for someone that wants to install these sub workflows. So that's kind of the plan. Edmund's done, done an awesome job in, in getting the CI hooked up for that. Um, and like I said, we still need to build a lot of the tooling for that with this NF4 sub workflows command. Um, and that would be in the NF4 tools package. So, you know, anyone that, that would like to contribute and help with that, um, it'd be awesome um, to have you on board. In terms of some potential um, things that we discussed, so Paolo, um, the main reason, I guess, for having you on this call is that um, for this, for this adoption of this new DSL2 syntax, there are a couple of things that would be nice to have implemented on next it. Most of the stuff you fix like ridiculously quickly anyway. Um, and I think in our discussions this morning, we basically tested other stuff and ruled out a bunch of other things that we don't need now and closed issues as a result of that. Um, so I think this is the main one left now. Otherwise we're, we're 
quickly, there's a couple of things here. I'll go through these issues with you. So we can maybe discuss amongst ourselves. Um, well, there's actually a few, but different priorities. Uh, right, okay. So this um, issue uh, is when you change Okay, so, so now say we've got a config like this, Paolo. Um, yeah. We've got extension. Yeah, exactly. So, so if we change, if we say I run the pipeline once and um, I realize that for Bechtel's Genome Cup, I want to use different tool specific arguments and I use resume with that and change this via a custom config, then what happens is that the, um, the workflow is actually still cached. It doesn't break the caching mechanism, whereas we would like it to. Cool the answer is if the thing is yes or no, I don't know, but I'm trying to right now. Yeah. Okay. So so that's basically one of one of one of the things. I mean again, it's not incredibly urgent because uh, the simple answer is we'll run the pipeline twice for now until we found a solution. Um, but it would be nice, even if it's not via this extension .args, because from what I understood from my chat, that anything that is task dot extension or anything that is task um, dot something isn't contributing to the caching mechanism. Is that right? Yeah, you can see what that is the, the point. So yeah. I'm doing a little for. So changing this via a custom config, and um, so for example, for those that don't know, say for example, this is the main modules config that comes with the pipeline, and you as a user want to update the so a command line argument for a tool because it's not working. We say you're working on a small genome or a large genome and stars are behaving very well, and you need to be able to change this argument but you don't want to remap all of the samples or whatever else, you just want it to resume from where it left off, um, then the idea would be to then have a custom. Process declaration. And again, this is another cool thing about this new syntax is that it will make it much easier to update options um, for users as well. I'll show you, I'll show you in a second. That's just as it is. Yeah, I confirm that any, not just for the X directive, any directive, um, if you change them across resume, they are not taking consideration because the <coughs> The, uh, the ID or the next row task is only computed taking consideration the input and the command string that you are going to run. And I think also like as an exception, the global variable. The point that here you are using them as a parameter. So, so. I mean, in theory, that the, the script section should be changing, but it, it then comes down to variable replacement. So if we look at a module, right? Um, right, so if we look at this module, um, this args coming in is coming in by task by extension args, which we've now just specified. Yeah. In our config file here, right? For example, um, and then this args then gets passed to the script section. So the the script section is changing, but that depends on whether this variable is evaluated or not, right? Yeah, I got your part. So that I need to I need to see how this. 
yeah so that would that would be awesome to have that sort of thing because it just means that it will deal with so many things in terms of options and passing arguments around if we can get changing this to break the resuming ability um, or even have something else that's not doesn't necessarily fit into this that would that would be awesome um so that's that issue there um which is this one there and then so these ones are niceties, uh, not necessarily required. Um, there's only one required, so I mean, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to have a good weekend probably. Um, there's only one really required, which is that task extension one. This is more of a nicety in that, and I think we brought this up with you before, is that we have to have this params or enable conda wrapped in oh. in an evaluation because if we just have and for those that don't know what I'm talking about, just ignore the comment of our code. Well, to make these modules as flexible as possible, it would be nice to declare all of these things in one place and to make them self enclosed. So if we just have conda via conda fast UC, because there isn't an enabling mechanism for conda at the moment in Nextflow, um, it will automatically activate and run conda even though we don't want it to right uh -huh. which is why we need this params to enable conda uh -huh. to actually then enable it otherwise set it to no and all that's really doing in the, in the pipeline file is, is just um, in the config all it's doing really is um it's just in a profile enabling conda like this maybe having like a, i don't know like this. If it's yeah, I, I remember this part. So the part here, if we are going to change now, we create a big mess for all the existing pipeline. Because we, if we say that uh, <coughs> just specifying the con, con the recipe is enabling the, the, the execution. I ah, know. It won't. Yeah. I don't think it will. So, I mean, all it would be would be we just change these. Oh, yeah. Three states. So, Boolean or. Okay. That's it. Yeah. So, if, if for example, you have a conda.enabled or enabled um, option in Nextflow, right? We're similar to what we have for Docker and Singularity like this, or Podman or, or any other sort of packaging system. If we have something like this, then all we would have to do really is just comment out. And replace this line um, and this line can be as simple as that we don't need to evaluate it because this will only get activated if conda is actually enabled if you see what i mean yeah yeah uh, but i'm thinking how we could do this without breaking the existing pipeline if it is enabled by default then it would probably mimic the current behavior so we could just set the enable to false in our nf core config file uh, good point yes so if you if if, if if it is so like so at the moment if we do this in the in the module then this will by default use conda so maybe we it's by default in next row set to true um, and we disable it in the pipeline config Manually, which is another option. Um, oh, wait. No. But again, that's that's more of a nicety. It'd be nice. It's sort of a nice to have type feature to get rid of this syntax. It's, I mean, it's not a big deal having a parameter doing this evaluation for now. Um, but I thought it's as we're on the topic of discussing, you know, where we would like to get eventually with this. Um, I think it's probably worth mentioning this as well. That's that. Um, yeah, so this isn't really a blocker. We updated this. Yeah, we found a bug potentially in next row, which I think Gregor has submitted a, an issue for somewhere that will. Not yet. I created a note in our board and we'll make a red X once I have a bit more time. 
perfect form. Um, and lastly, I think is this custom script stuff that we talked about before. So, um, so it would be nice to have modules local. Or, uh, you have a folder for a given module like this, um, and so this is the module, and that essentially all that's doing. Um, All that's doing is calling this GTF to bed executable. Um, it'd be nice to be able to have self enclosed or isolated module type scopes, I guess, if you call it that, that where paths and stuff are exported um, on, on shared file systems or on, on AWS Batch or anywhere else um, that automatically appends this bin directory to wherever this module is run somehow. Um, and that will allow us to basically have custom modules on NF4 modules as well, because at the moment it's, it, it, it needs, I mean, we've, we've talked about it to death, but I think it ideally it needs some sort of next load type implementation to, to make it work. So wherever the module is run, um, the bin directory for the scripts for that module are also exported into path or whatever else to, to then um, run that module. Yeah, remember this is uh, not the first time. So, yeah, sure I think we it. talked about the fact that it would be different on a shared file system compared to um, AWS Batch and stuff. Um, but yeah, this is a nicety as well that we would like, hopefully, to have in the future to, to work. Um, and I think some other people have requested it as well, but, but it's not urgent. So, I guess to summarize, I mean, we don't need much from you, but um, <laughs> there, there'd be a few things. Um, that would be great to have. Um, I don't so know if I missed anything the, 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 the that anyone would like to or resume, no? mention or say, or ask Paolo for that matter, whilst he's here. I don't know if you can hear me. Maybe not. But I think he's not hearing you, no? We can hear you, but I feel I don't know. Oh, OK. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. can you hear Paolo or not? No. Because I think you were not hearing him. I don't know why. He's too far away from the stage, I guess. That doesn't matter, no? Does it matter? I think you need to be in a spotlight that the whole room can hear you. Oh. So maybe, maybe, come on stage, Paolo. Come and join. Try. <laughs> I'll give you, I'll, yeah, there's, there's um... I'm jumping. With your oh. official award ceremony. Yes, please go to the ghost and you pass you can pass to people. <laughs> yeah. Make sure you go to okay. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So my understanding is that the most important one is this point about the resume with the configuration settings. Yes. Yeah, likely it makes sense to, to to allow this. I don't know if we should only do for the this X school or for everything. So the thing but, is, at the moment, because we but, because we're prototyping stuff. We can be quite driven by what you add to Nextflow. So if you don't want to break existing stuff with how X is working, if there's another directive or another option that you'd like to add that isn't cached, we can easy, quite easily adopt that because we haven't really used this with any brute force yet. So we're quite flexible. Well, because I was also thinking it's consistent the logic to not include or to, to include, but for example, If a task was executed successfully and you increase the memory, in theory, there is no reason to re execute that, that task. So, changing the memory should not impact the caching. This was, I think, the, the rationale the same for the CPU, the same. But On the other hand, with the CPU, I'm not so sure. For instance, I recently had an example with single cell data where if you run it in parallel, it will. Get another UMAP plot than if you run it on a single CPU. So for reproducibility, it might even make sense to include the CPU in the caching mechanism. 
And why? Okay, because you will say you want to say you perform piece. better. That's a issue of the tool personally that one should use a proper um the, the tool should be fixed itself so that it reproduces the correct it should but like if, if i change my next store contact file and rerun the pipeline and it says um, yeah everything is cached it's all right and i publish the result and then someone else runs the pipeline on another system but now it the result is not cached but it uses the updated cpu value and it then gets a different result then the pipeline is not reproducible Agreed, but I would still report this as a as an issue for the tool. I did. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it really makes sense, surely makes sense that if there is one of these task hierarchies uh, mentioned in the command script, if the, that hierarchy change, surely we should uh, invalidate the, the cache for that task because, yeah. But you're expecting that change that value, so change the script, so it should be executed. Yeah, I think it could be done. I would say the embassy without the constraint, it's not so crazy that the logic behind, but it should be possible. Yeah, so I mean, I guess that you know, we, we, we can be driven by whatever you think is best on the next low end, um, it just we're quite flexible at the moment in terms of the only, the only thing would make sense that if you could open up an issue on next floor for this would be great. Okay. I think my hash already already did that. For this, I will remember. I think I did, but I don't remember now. Oh, oh okay. yeah, you did, yeah. You did, yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent. I will yeah, remember so. another one. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. Thank you. Right. Anything else? Any questions about the new syntax? Um, any objections? Any wild? No, no, it's pretty beautiful. I think clean up a lot in the logic make for sustainable uh, and above all, I think, because in the future. There's always a plan to have a better way to manage the task up with the pipeline output. So it's a good step towards a better mechanism that we should should have in next to manage the output, not using the published here in the context of the task, but a separate mechanism more configure oriented. So you're already on the good path. Right. From the man himself. So any any other any other questions in the audience about the new syntax adoption? Um, anything else that um, you'd like to know or help with or just anything? Just don't un unmute yourself and speak. One thing I'm wondering about, um, since uh, we're kind of simultaneously discussing it, um, the, so there's a pull request for fly at the moment, and um, is there a method at the, uh, currently to pull in different types of data? Because I mean, the, the initial tuple is the meta and then reads, but Fly assembler, for example, takes in PyPyO reads, takes, takes in nanopore reads, um, and it requires also like a um, a label um, as well to, to differentiate between um, the two different types of inputs. Um, and so when you pass the meta thing in, which would likely have the, the label as well, so PyPyO, for example, and then the reads. Um, currently, it kind of limits it to one uh, input set. Do we have a mechanism to kind of like be able to pass both um, nanopore 
um, with the tag nanopore and pack bio with the tag nanopore to the same process. And that's in the current like way of specifying input. Because I, I mean, I know we can manipulate the channel inputs with like all the branch operators and whatnot, but it kind of then moves away from how NF core is specifying the input. A bit. Yeah, I, th I think this is in 99.9% .9 of cases what we have will work, but then you'll always get these outliers that, that sort of want to do things slightly differently. Um, and I guess the simple answer so it could so this module can take pack bio and nanopore at the same time and it what sort of labeled is it? is it a value or what what's is it what is that um, label? it needs it needs to be able to um for each type of read input um you specify a a flag so you do like a dash dash pack bio raw uh followed by the pack bio reads dash dash pack bio um uh, sorry, uh, nanopore raw or nanopore corrected. Um, and that would kind of like be the type that would come in with the meta, I guess. Um, there's probably a way to do it. I can't think of a simple way. Um, what you might be able to do is pass the reads in themselves as a list possibly where you've got, I don't know, the first element is, is this mode like pack bio or nanopore, and then you have a channel of reads within that. So you've got a nested list of, of uh, platform and reads, and then you can you can have that can be as big as you want or as small as you want. And yeah. then you have to somehow read that into the channel context, and uh, sorry, in the module context and evaluate that to replace okay. it in the module. That's what I proposed already, but um, yeah, it's... I think that I think that would be the simplest option for now. Um, is separating out the, the the reads in the channel by platform and allowing the module to figure out how to use that information. Yeah. Any more questions or comments? Right. So we've got an hour left now until the wrap up. Um, and I won't expect anything less than solving world peace in the next 55 minutes. So, um, yeah, the last sprint. <laughs> thank you for joining. I hope it's been useful. Um, and I'll see you guys back here in about an hour. And thank you, Paolo, for coming in. Oh, thank you for having uh, me. This is so cool. Joining us. Ciao, thank you. Thanks, guys. Ciao. Bye.